A lot of you have uh, met Mike last year. Um, we had Mike come and tell us a little bit about the changes that are happening in our country and how they might feed the case, help build the case for inner city high speed rail. And it was so successful that we decided to have Mike back again this year. Because one of the fundamental questions is we look around the world, we see wonderful high speed rail in Europe and Asia and Japan. Um, and we can't send everybody over there to ride it and come back and say, let's get this. So there is a question. Um, are trends in the United States uh, leading us to form mega regions that kind of mimic the densities and distances in other countries where inner city high speed rail uh, has been successful? And so it seems entirely appropriate to have Mike come up and talk to us about, are we trending in that direction? Is this a good base, a good platform for us to build our advocacy efforts on? We have a whole toolkit that we need to put together in order to convince policymakers that inner city high speed rail is the way to go. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Alexander for those of you who don't know him. And uh, for those do, already say hey to Mike. He is the center, uh, the director of the Center for Livable Communities at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time together today. And I, I have to, again, say I'm, I'm here uh, because I love you guys. I love what you're doing. Uh, I'm really in charge of long range planning for the Atlanta Regional Commission, the MPO functions, all that stuff at the ARC. And I've, I've, I've dabbled in data and long range forecasting. So you're going to see a little bit of that. And last year we put together some national data for this group. And a really, I didn't want to repeat that, but there are a lot of new faces in the room. So uh, I'm going to talk and use some of those slides that I used last year that have been updated. But I've also got some new information. We've got some really neat data people back at the ARC now. Our younger staff are blowing it out. It's the first time ever we've made national census track level uh, maps for the whole United States for employment and employment density. So we're going to finish on that because that's fun for me. And I think you'll get a kick out of it. And you guys will be the first to see it and can give me some feedback about that. I'm going to go very quickly through this deck. So if you want the PowerPoint right now, uh, you can hold up your iPhone and point your camera at the iPhone and that QR code will allow you to download it. It'll be at the end as well uh, so that you can go ahead and get it if you don't want to go to the APTA website. But APTA is religious about putting stuff up on their website, so it will be there as well. So um, always begin uh, with this McKinsey quote because, you know, I, I talk nationally, I talk locally about the fact that there are some metropolitan places that are doing quite well. There are a lot of metropolitan places that aren't growing at all. That's true in the United States. That's true globally. And so we're going to explore that idea in detail. I think Chris really nailed it to say the United States is trending more towards European and Asian densities. We are not there yet, but I think the employment data at the end will start to show you how we're really starting to concentrate our economic growth um, into our city centers. And that's really a big opportunity for you as the high speed rail community to talk about that because it creates a, obviously a better opportunity to create high speed linkages between those places. And so last year I had this in my last slide and it was kind of an afterthought. Well, it became a primary thought for uh, the last 12 months. I have been really really digging into this idea of where office space has been uh, really developing and what that means for our economies. And I'm going to explore that with you. So um, this is a new slide. Uh, and it really just kind of ranks growth over the last 10 years uh, for metropolitan areas across the US. It's an index of jobs, um, metropolitan product growth, and change in young firms. And I put selected numbers up there to show you real quickly you know, who's doing well and who's really not quite doing as well as those do wellers, right? And that's a critical thing because you're going to see lots of tech centric places on that map, and that's critical for us to be thinking about. And um, I made this, and I, I was with some people uh, from Japan last night, and I was talking about this slide. 
Asako, so you can see it. And so now you can see the word I was trying to pronounce just to give you a scale of population density to set a tone for all the other slides that are coming to say, you know, in Japan, they've been doing high-speed rail for a long time, and the population serving area, that core network, is about 81 million people. So that's sort of our benchmark for uh, really population density going forward in these slides and show you the contrast between the West Coast, the Northeast, and um, London and Paris, critically, as places that also have um, rail service. All right. So again, this is my fancy data. It just looks like a green map to you, but that's some Python scripting, that's some API crawl scripting that our staff has done to normalize census track level employment data for the whole United States. The reason why you don't see any colors is because most of the job growth is happening at the intersection of that proposed future high-speed rail network, and I'm gonna drill into the, some of those areas here in a few minutes. So. Demographics, what's really going on? Pew made this wonderful small report about um, population growth out to 2100. And I've been using this back home to make some critical points. And the one I, I really focus on is look at China in 2020, and then look at China's population in 2100. They're still gonna have a billion people, but they're gonna be minus 400 million people over the next 80 years huge population changes on this planet. The ranking of countries is gonna change. India will have the largest population. The oldest region on this planet will actually be Latin America and the Caribbean. So if we're really starting to try to understand what's likely to happen in growth on this planet, this is the most important slide that I can possibly show you. And again, I didn't have this in the deck last year. But again, 90 countries are expected to lose population out to 2100. Now think back in your mind when I was talking about metropolitan areas that are doing quite well. Where is that population changing and why is critical for us to understand. And it's just simple demographics. This is my first way to try to entertain you. I'm gonna hit click here in a second. A lot of you have seen this, you're giggling already because the bubbles are gonna move. They're countries, they're color coded by continent their size by population, the axes are life expectancy and total fertility rate. So let's see over uh, 200 years how life expectancy and total fertility have changed on this planet. So I know there's some French citizens with us today. France is actually highlighted. Um, Japan is not, I'm sorry. I should have remade it for you guys. Um, the United States Civil War is gonna happen, so you're gonna see the United States bubble go down. And then, of course, the industrialization that's going to occur on this planet is really going to start to impact the fertility rate as people move off of farms. And, of course, yellow countries are Europe, so the Spanish influenza and World War I are going to have a big impact. And then World War II, for the European countries mostly, and then, of course, uh, the demographics are going to change dramatically after World War II. The Chinese one-child policy comes into effect, which obviously they've now abandoned. And of course, the blue countries are Africa, and they are lagging behind. But generally speaking, we're all still alive. Most of us would not have been here today if it were 200 years ago. That's a good thing. Aging is not a bad thing. It's a great thing. You're still here. Enjoy it, right? So all this talk about aging and you know, tsunamis and all these things, you gotta let that go. This is the new normal for us as a planet. We have a large, older population. And of course, it's because every race and ethnicity in the state of Georgia now is below replacement birth level. So do not expect population growth to happen because of natural increase. That means places will compete more and more for migration. And we were just talking about Chris Brady's point about Amazon and how competitive, uh, it became for metropolitan areas in the United States when Amazon proposed to relocate um, some of its headquarter jobs, right? And my joke about that was Amazon was like the most beautiful um, woman, the most handsome man, and they stood up and said, we want to get married. And every metropolitan place in the United States had to look in the mirror and say, am I good enough for Amazon? And we went through that process in Atlanta, we did a lot of advanced travel modeling to try to understand that. And of course, transit, and mobility became a big issue 
for Amazon. And again, I think Chris is absolutely right. It's reinvigorated this conversation around transit because we know the demographics behind this mean that you are going to have to double down in trying to attract the Amazons of the future to your metropolitan area because there's not likely to be a lot of growth without um, that type of competitiveness if you're a place where your demographics are really lagging behind. All right, and so this is uh, something I made to get at this idea of aging. So I'm going to hit play. This is share, share of 60 plus, starts in 1950, it goes out to 2100, select countries. So you can see that share change that happened truthfully in Italy first, and then Japan, where you had a big run up in that share of older people. And then, of course, China's one-child policy has had a huge impact. And then falling birth rates in Mexico out into the far years of the forecast will have a big, big impact in Mexico. So again, a new normal, a large older population, right? A large voting older population. And what are they going to value? What are they going to be willing to invest in is a critical question for you all to be thinking about. And again, I'm going to click quickly through this, but you should go back and look at this. Like, you're not going to get population from rural areas in your metropolitan areas because we've already basically emptied those places out, right? There's not a lot of people to migrate anymore to metropolitan areas. And so for the United States, we're almost done with this decade. People like me are just waiting for the census to see if we were right or we were wrong in our own estimate work. Right, and you can see Dallas, Houston doing quite well, but also New York, right? Big population growth in New York. And of course, the change in population by race and ethnicity is this critical story for the United States. Without diverse population growth and increases, most of our metropolitan areas, especially in the Northeast, would be losing population already. And this is just um, a simple demographic fact. And you see those big blues, that's large white population declines in these metropolitan areas. And it's being offset by uh, increases in black, Asian, and Hispanic population. But even those rates of growth are slowing down now. And so this is something I showed the APTA CEOs. Obviously, they're thinking about um, the routing in their own systems and what's going on. And so this is relatively complicated, but generally simple for me to explain. So the idea is all you really have to look at is central city, low income displacement. And that's just tracks where there's a lot of population change, where at least 10% of the population that's low income has moved out, and at least 10% of that population increase is from high income households. So it's a pretty good proxy measure for how central cities are actually changing, right? And so Atlanta's rate was 21%. And the only rate that was higher, because I've got these slides hidden, was actually Washington, D.C.'s at 36% for central city displacement. So what that really tells you is there's been a lot of change in the core central cities. And I think you guys probably recognize this. The old narratives about growth in the central city and suburbs have changed, especially coming out of the Great Recession. And we need to be mindful of that. And that's why that employment data I'm going to show you is so critical. All right, b the big numbers for us still consistent. Um, the Mid-Atlantic expected to add the most people. And of course, I'm going to hit play here for a second. Um, most of you don't care, but there's a huge football game being played in Atlanta this Saturday. As an Auburn fan, it doesn't mean as much to me, but a lot of my friends went to Florida. So, and most of the people I spend my life with went to Georgia. So this is population growth on bo both axes. CA is obviously California. So you can see California's growth rate. The South becomes habitable with air conditioning. So Texas and Florida are really expected to be the big growers. There's no stopping them. Everything is bigger in Texas. So um, we're going to reset this now. And that's, that's really the pattern of growth. So Georgia, North Carolina, a lot of these mid-Atlantic states where we're from, really not growing at the same rate as a Florida or a Texas long term. 
And then this is the unique data we put together for you guys. We looked at AMPO's website and we really started to build county level data for these mega regions because this is the critical geography for you guys to think about how you're gonna make these connections. I know we've got some people working on Cascadia right, uh, in the room today. So if we overlay that high speed rail network, what does that really look like with our mega regions? And then if you look at county level growth, of population, uh, I mean, MSA level growth, we're expected to be the big, big population changers, those deep purple areas like Atlanta, where I'm from. And then this is the critical map. The places that Woods and Pool, and Woods and Pool never, never, never likes to show slow population growth. It's a commercial data set, it's pretty aggressive, but even Woods and Pool has really a large share of the counties in the United States actually losing population long term, right? And so if you look at positive population growth and you take away those um, minuses, you've still got relatively slow growth in most counties in the United States. And those oranges and purples are a relatively small area where we expect most of the population growth to occur in the United States. And it's the possibility of future connections I think I heard continue to beat the drum, right? I think we've seen the turn. I think good days are coming for high-speed rail. And this map, as much as anything, points towards that possibility of population densities that are um, really where they need to be to help maximize the potential of people getting on the trains. And so just to show you in population employment, um, those mega regions as, uh, as individual points. I'm going to hit play here in just a second. And you can see their relative growth rates. ROUS is rest of the United States. So California is <laughs> expecting to grow more than the whole rest of the United States, not represented, right? And then the rest comes on a little bit, but you can see Texas really coming out of the back of the pack and this neck and neck race for growth and relatively slow growth in some of the smaller um, mega regions. But on the whole, lots of population and employment growth is a short story of this bubble chart. So hopefully I could give you a bunch of numbers. I'm trying to entertain you a little bit with the bubble charts. If you ever want the numbers, we'd be happy to make those available to you. All right, so this is brand new metro level growth from 1969, both axes are, um, there are different population employment. So hopefully it'll go. Oh. You know how to scroll and um, on the bottom left of the image and try to hit play, if you can. It's fun for all the Texas people to see Dallas. Or maybe not. Oh, we had it. And so how is the pattern of metropolitan growth changing? Great recession. And then here comes Atlanta out of the back of the pack competing with Washington. Houston and Dallas expected to really overtake uh, Chicago in the out years of this forecast. So that's a huge change in the population pop, population pattern of the United States in a relatively short period of time. And just to show you how it looks for the smaller metros. And again, uh, St. Louis really doesn't have the same trajectory anymore. It's demographics. It's a continued lack of investment and growth. And so I, I took the big ones away just so you could see the relative growth rate of Washington and Atlanta without Dallas, Houston, and the big three. And there's San Francisco on the job side. So big population change differences in the metropolitan areas that aren't on a coastline, right? And that's the key challenge. And the age differences at the metro level, lots of reds in Florida, lots of reds in the Northeast where our older population is. And of course, because of the household composition, the households are older, you don't expect as much population growth. And then I put this in just for you guys because when you're thinking about 
especially the voting electorate, what do we look like today as a nation? And so the most common age now is like almost Chris Brady's age. <laughs> Am I wrong? And of course, my age, well, I'm getting up there. I'm 49 now, so I'm like the least almost of, of really a 30-year range of, of white age. But again, you can see those, those larger numbers in Hispanic black population and Asian population, especially in that millennial age group. But right now, still, the population composition of the United States is dominated by um, white baby boomers, right? And my daughters are fascinated by, OK, Karen, OK, Boomer, all this stuff. So they're constantly sending me memes about that. And baby Yodas, which I don't mind. All right, so now, thinking about all this growth, especially, um, and I'm going to talk a lot about the Bay Area today, because I got my eye on the Bay Area. And there's some reasons for that. So. San Jose, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. Coming back to that slide, getting almost 50% of the office space market absorption quarter one, 2018. That's always going to be shocking to me, right? How is that possible in a country of 317 million people? So I started looking at cluster data on the Harvard website. And you're going, all right, that's not very valuable. Stay with me on this, OK? So this is traded clusters. That means you're doing something that you sell some other place, which means you actually make money. So traded cluster is business services. So what does business services link to? And then you start to see fundamentally what a metropolitan economy looks like, right? So if you're business services, who are you interacting with? And it's pretty interesting, right? And that's generally a standard idea across the United States. And then where are those strongest linkages? And then you see the, the way they color-coded the lines. Harvard, Harvard built the website of the world with this stuff. And so if I drill down a little bit, and we start to talk about ITs, and we think about location quotients, where we have a greater share of jobs in a particular area than the US as a whole, then you start to see, like a Seattle, where in IT, they have a specialization location quotient of over 3.5. That's an unbelievably high location quotient number, right? And so where are those jobs really located? And so I'm looking at that, and I'm going, those are pretty big numbers, right? These are traded clusters. This is where we're making money, right? Not your local economy. So I finally had to use some numbers. My first numbers today, right? I'm 20 slides in, and I have to put these numbers up because what's critical is for you guys to see that actually information technology, San Jose, has fewer jobs today than it did in 1998. Don't cross your eyes. So that was pretty surprising to me. So I built the chart on the right to get at this idea. So if you look at the net change, we all, we're all thinking about software publishers. When you think of San Jose now, you're thinking of a young person on a laptop building an app, right? That's generally. But they used to make a lot of chips. And the chip production is now gone. So the reality is in the United States, that sector, one of the highest paying sectors, one of the sectors we would typically look at as one of these good benchmarks for how regions are succeeding has actually changed, and I wasn't really paying attention to the nuts and bolts that the manufacturing side of this cluster has really diminished for the United States, in particular, a place like San Jose. Because you do see some metropolitan places that have actually added jobs. Atlanta killed it. We added 1,000 jobs over 20 years in this sector. We burned it up, right? But it's critical to start to understand this stuff because this is really um, for us, a way to have a canary in the coal mine for how metropolitan areas are likely to succeed and grow because we know all that office space was getting consumed in San Francisco, right? So who was really taking it down? Well, it was the software publishers, but at the same time, there are a lot of people that aren't making chips anymore in that area as well. So that's critical to understand the pattern change on employment because we have been talking about this for a while. There's an unlimited demand for software developers on this planet. But in particular, the United States is doing quite well. China's doing quite well. 
as well, right? So I will do anything to get my two teenage daughters to major in programming. They will not do it to save anything. A Corvette, not going to do it for them. But they will be employed and off our rolls as quickly as possible if I could get them to do this. There are some places when you're looking at postings per employed that you wouldn't normally think about, like a Huntsville, Alabama. I learned to store ammunition in Huntsville, Alabama. They paid me to learn how to store ammunition there. There's lots of engineers and software programs still today in Huntsville related to NASA and the Department of Defense. So they're punching above their weight. Again, a proxy for really metropolitan economies as a whole. And so what we realized is in metropolitan Atlanta, you think of it as just this programming company, right? A software company. But that's not the reality. The reality is that you've got Anthem Blue Cross as the third highest posting company in metropolitan Atlanta for software developers. Right? Now look down that list. Macy's. I got lost in Macy's last night. They're looking for programmers. It's not that these companies are really isolated more. It's that old adage that every company is now a tech company is actually true. And that's what this slide shows you, that everybody is looking for the software uh, support help to make their business unit stronger. And it's really across the economy now. So that looking at software developer postings is absolutely critical to understanding the US economy. Now. I love this slide. It's a great slide. It's very legible. Absolutely legible. I know everybody can read it in detail. So I was fired up about that slide I already showed you, so I went and downloaded all this office space data for the United States. And so to make it a little more legible, even though it was perfectly legible before, I want you to look in the top right. Some of you are responsible for leasing up for your companies and agencies. But right now, the average marketed rent, marketed, not what they're actually getting, $92 a square foot in San Francisco. Now, what's your emotional reaction to that? Right, yeah. You sh I mean, I'm caught off guard. Why is it still growing if it's $92 a square foot? So we're going to explore that a little bit. But look at these other places. Austin, $49 a square foot. Now, of course, I kept Atlanta on here. We're down there at a healthy $29 a square foot. We have a unique office market in Metro Atlanta. We always have a high vacancy rate. But clearly, these, these places are doing quite well, right? And so San Francisco's office space is higher than New York's. Austin. Austin, higher than Los Angeles. Seattle, higher than Washington, D.C. And all of those are higher than Boston. So that's when I say there's been a concentration of economic growth in these very specific areas. What's a better indicator than what the fetching price is for office space? And so just to give you some rank information on vacancy rates, total vacancy, um, how hot those markets are, look at San Francisco, right? There's so much economic pressure there in the high tech side that they've really blown up the way we would think about the office market in the United States. Is that sustainable? So I'm working out with someone who said they just took a job with Stanford Medical. I'm in Atlanta. I'm like, how'd you do that? Are you moving? Not moving. I'm commuting every week. What are you doing? Helping them hire people. OK. And then they just said, you know, Stanford Medical is paying registered nurses $200,000 a year. She said it's not sustainable. We can't afford that long term. But to get a nurse to work in their system in the Bay Area, they are paying. Chris and I are going back to school, <laughs> right, and moving to San Francisco because that's a wage that is really beyond anything I would have thought possible for that particular occupation. But that's what's happening. That's the economic pressure in these, these critical areas. And there's no, it doesn't seem to be stopping. And so real quickly, just to fill out this idea, and you guys think a lot about this, where are big changes in super commuters? Right? Because that person I was talking to is beyond a super commuter because they're commuting almost 3,000 miles every week to work, right? And coming back to Atlanta and 
Stanford Medical is subsidizing it. But again, this is a trend as well that I've got in the back of my mind about what long distance travel can potentially mean when you've got a San Francisco paying 92, you're paying $92 a square foot for office. How are you willing to move people? And so um, that same person told me this. Now, Metro Atlanta, we have an audacious goal. Our mayor wants to do a billion dollars in capital campaign uh, fundraising for a, an affordable housing fund. And we thought, that's crazy. That's a lot of money. It'll be hard to get there. And then the state of California and Stanford have basically negotiated that Stanford's going to put $4.5 billion into affordable housing because of the facts that I've already told you. So this is the economic pressure in that area. And so it is starting to spill over. Remember I have said Blue Cross Blue Shield is, is um, really uh, trying to look for software developers? Well, in California, they're moving from San Francisco to Oakland. They're not moving from San Francisco to Atlanta. They're moving to Oakland. If you go read this article, and I hope you do, it's because they know they've got a 15-minute train ride between Oakland and San Francisco. So now Oakland will end up being one of the biggest changers, I think, in office space development over the next 30 years because of that San Francisco pressure. And I don't think there's anything else like it in the United States. And so that drove us to try to figure out how to make an employment map of the whole United States that was sub-county. And so there's not a lot of detail for here for you guys to really dig into, but just to say the data is there, except for Massachusetts and South Dakota, because South Dakota is south of North Dakota, they didn't publish their data to the census website. So there's two big green holes there. And if I give you just the places where there's been a lot of employment change coming out of the recession, you can barely see the red, right? This is the problem with big census tracts. You're thinking, oh, there's some big areas of change in, in especially like a North Dakota because of fracking. But when you really get into the big changers, and you start to put back on the high-speed rail network, you really see most of the job changes absolutely located in these core areas. And that's my best message for uh, you as a group today. And it's a lot of fun making these kind of maps. And so if we look at office employment densification, it's a very similar story, right? And so I made these for you. I don't know how this is where I'm like testing this idea out because they're the same scale. Like the geography here is literally identical. So you can see LA's very, 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 very diverse <laughs> employment market. And then you see the Bay Area where you just have huge areas where they just haven't developed. But the, you know, obviously San Jose, Palo Alto, Santa Clara, they've had a lot of densification there as well, right? That's a great opportunity for, for big connections um, in the future in this country. Seattle and Portland. Portland's a relatively small place, right? And so you see some differences there. But Seattle's concentrating uh, really along two corridors in their employment market. And then Dallas, all over the place, Dallas, everywhere, right? And that's why these maps are so much fun, because you can see the patterns so clearly. And then Metro Atlanta, we, we go up to 400 spine. That's us. But there's a ton of office development happening in Midtown in, in uh, Atlanta. And it, there's really no stopping it. It is our San Francisco of districts in metropolitan Atlanta. And then just to change it up for the Midwest, see how different Detroit's pattern is? Yes. They bought up a bunch of buildings downtown, right, and are redeveloping them. I and it's had a little bit of an impact. But the office-serving jobs in Detroit really aren't happening in a core. And they don't still really have any local transit service that's anything other than bus still today. And then, of course, Chicago, very concentrated in their core as well. And then to finish up on this idea, the scale of New York, I mean, New York is doing quite well. The two Amazons, right, the two Amazons, they have the labor force 
they already had big tech companies. Everything was right for Washington and New York to be selected by Amazon. And the continued pressure on the employment markets here is, is pretty great, but Washington's is, is unique because you'll see in the core coming out of the recession, um, maybe not so much on the federal employee side, uh, there hasn't been a lot of job growth. So that's impacting the pattern there. And so I did that really, I think, effectively. We're on time. And so any questions or thoughts? You want me to keep the maps in? Should I dump them? What do you think? Let's say that we are able to make some real change, to have a paradigm shift in the way we do this. How would you use your data on a zero basis, that is looking at a map blank map, to draw a new high performance passenger rail system in this country? Um, there's, there's never a blank map in my mind. <laughs> You know, the, the map is there, like where is the economic potential that you can actually incentivize? It's not that one drives the other. It has to kind of go, I think, hand in hand. Uh, we're seeing on the t technology side really a, a continued concentration. We all follow our suburban markets back home. They're doing okay. But to be honest with you, two million square feet of office space has relocated in metropolitan Atlanta into the core from suburban markets. That's a lot of office space. So we know that that trend is happening nationally. And so to get at that idea is, I would expect long term there to be continued concentration in existing employment centers in already fast growing places. So my lines would really start to connect up. When I looked at the high speed rail proposed network, there's a lot there that is as someone who looks at employment data and population data, a lot that, that, that we like. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty effective. There are places that aren't going to grow as much, but generally speaking, especially the West Coast and the Northeast, um, I, think, I think Paul's absolutely right. The, the numbers are already there, and they're only going to get better. And a place like Texas, I know Chris has worked on this for years. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, with the population growth in Texas, um, and hopefully our, our Piedmont, my region, you know, there's, there's some opportunities there as well if we can especially protect the corridors for future development. But um, the existing lines, to actually answer your question, look, look pretty great. Um, and so I'm excited. I'm in a good mood. So it's a matter of <laughs> tweaking, basically. Tweaking. Yeah, I like that word, tweaking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any observation about what accounts for the mismatch in perception between uh, the fact that we have a declining population and we need more immigrants, and yet anti-immigration policy uh, is so strong here, as well as in Europe and other places? Uh, and does that have something to do with the fact that you know we're a country of baby boomers and maybe we don't see things the way they really are? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big question for a staff level person at the ARC. Often I love to punt <laughs> on questions like that because it is politicized. Yeah. But I really just try to be honest and fact-based about the demographic changes themselves and what that really means. I mean, we have to demonstrate value to the whole population. And one of the things we know in our local surveys is your perceptions of what's important do change over the course of your lifetime. You care a lot about education in your 40s because you have kids in school. The minute my two get out of high school, I don't care about public education anymore. I care about loan rates. So, and then it really shifts to safety. And so we've learned this at the local level because all politics is still local. I've been wanting to say that for a while, um, to quote Tip O'Neill. Uh, you know, if we can do that at the local level, I think the national conversation will be good as well. Because, you know, I don't shy away from the word saying infrastructure. It's a big word, but it's maybe our most important word, right? We have to invest in infrastructure. There, there are people in this room whose countries have done a doggone good job of investing in infrastructure. And I look up to them, to be honest with you. I have a lot of respect for what they've done, and we need to mirror it. And we need to take pride in infrastructure itself and convince especially our older population about the value of that and what it means economically. So the personal anecdote on that is that my father had Parkinson's disease. And I took care of him for 14 years, up until the point he was in a nursing home. And his, his end of life was near us doing a T-splost. 
And really, I had to get fundamental with this idea that even though my dad was in this nursing home, wheelchair bound, and eventually bedridden, the people that were taking care of him had to get to work, right? Even if you're not any more participating in the economic system the way you did in the, your prime working age years, you absolutely need the system. We need to learn to value that as well. It's so critical that we've got, especially low-income workers across metropolitan Atlanta that need to get to those jobs. And that's the interesting thing. If you go Google the research before I came up here today, a lot of low, mid-income workers are commuting unbelievably long distances to work. It's just not our high-end consultants and the like doing this. So it's a critical issue for you guys, and that's why I'm happy to be here with you to talk about this. But we've got to get more people to buy into it, right? Let's give Mike Alexander a big hand. So takeaways from Mike Alexander's presentation are, there's really too much in this to take away all at once. Dave Carroll and I were just talking about how we could probably do a week-long seminar with each one of these slides and drill down into them and, and then do another week about how we would take what we learned at the end of that week and plug it into what we try to do here every day. Um, the other thing is, I just have to say on a note of personal thanks that I'm glad he mentioned rankings by age instead of by weight because uh, <laughs> and it's a perfect segue i mean we talked at the beginning about this being a sort of a building block leading to the advocacy job we all need to do and if there's anybody sitting in the audience from the dallas to houston project hey Lori, um, from cascadia karen and Paige, um in the northeast corridor david and, and all the Amtrak folks, and you're not thrilled by what he just showed you on these charts, then you're in the wrong room because that was uh, certainly the building block that tells you why there's such excitement about these projects.